same with the uh, yeah, owned characters, uh, like uh, the whole Supergirl, Aquaman, and so forth. Uh, do you receive a lot of pushback from editors who don't like what you're doing? Well, if I do it, quit. I mean, for example, um, when I was writing Aquaman, um, I was getting all kinds of pushback from the editor. And I wound up quitting the book because I couldn't work for the editor because the pushback he was giving me made no sense. Um, he wanted me to write, you know, he, he would tell me, I want to have stories in which Aquaman is shown to be a powerful leader. But don't, you know, don't put so many characters in the book. Just have Aquaman. And I want stories with heavy politics, but stay out of Atlantis. You know, and it's like, you can't operate when the editor is giving you conflicting statements all the time. Um, I walked over with X Factor many years ago because I was getting pushed back. Interestingly enough, in the cases where I walked out, not too long thereafter, the editors wound up getting fired. <laughs> so, you know, I tend to think it's them, not me. I mean, Eric Larson fired, followed me on Aquaman. He was really delighted to be following me on Aquaman until he got onto the book. And some months later, after quitting the book, said, and I will always treasure these words, Peter David was right. Um, what do you think of, um, seems like every couple of years, the big two, Marvel and DC, are always seem to be constantly rebooting. And rebooting. I mean, that you have all that history and continually and fast, but then they just wipe it blank. Well, DC does that. Marvel doesn't. We have done stories that erase certain things, like Peter Parker's marriage. Yeah. But we have never done a story that rebooted it. We never did a story that said Peter never married Mary Jane. Yes, he did. It's just that nobody remembers it, including people marriage. DC does that constantly. And I think that's tremendously unfair to the readership. Um, to say, OK, all the stories that you've invested in for the last 15, 20 years, they don't matter anymore. Because we're now going to ignore those and take the characters off in completely different directions. Whenever Marvel does something that may seem like a reboot, it's really not. The characters' histories in Marvel have continued on a linear path. They've gone off in some weird <coughs> directions, but it has always been a continuous path. We've never turned around and said to the, to the readers, everything that you read in the previous years has no relevance anymore. You know? We have tried we have tried to differentiate ourselves from DC in that regard because we really believe it is not fair to the readership to just wipe away everything that they, they you know that, that they've done. That they've read about. Marvel does a lot of retconning. Yeah. Retconning, I guess that's the better term, but Yeah. Although I've heard rumors that uh, that's the, the purpose of Secret Wars, is just gonna climax in Yes. So Marvel is doing a reboot? No, I'm saying yes, it's for this bit. All I will tell you is that Marvel has never done something like that before. So the question is, are we breaking precedent for the first time in 75 years? Or are we just setting you up to think that? <laughs> <laughs> Is there a DC character you'd like to write sometime? Well, again, I've written pretty much, you know, all the DC characters at some point or another. So, probably the one I'd most like to take a whack at is Captain Marvel. You know, not ironically, because of the name. <coughs> I, just, I just love the whole Billy Batson, you know. Mm -hmm. I love the whole fundamental innocence of Captain Marvel that I think has gotten somewhat lost as they've tried to modernize it. I would love to just do Captain Marvel and just take him back to his roots. It's probably then nobody would buy, but you know, it's underwriter for three or four years. This could be a whole panel itself, but maybe just briefly uh, comment on your, your own personal writing process. Okay. Uh, how maybe that differs between writing a novel or a comic book, or like when you sit down, like what are some things you do creatively My or just in your process? process? Is not different. 
The only difference is that when I'm writing a novel, I don't have to worry about the visuals. If I'm writing a comic book story, I have to always be aware of how it's going to look like on page. And I have to, you know, I have to be very, very careful with the visuals. If I'm writing a novel, I can have two people in a room sitting there talking for 10 pages. And as long as the conversation is yeah. interesting, you're going to be with it. I can't have two people sitting in a room talking on a comic book for 20 pages. You know, it's, it's going to be insane. It's going to be visually phenomenally dull. Um, so, you know, that that is the major difference. Otherwise, though, there's fundamental rules of writing that remain consistent, whether you're writing a novel, a book, a screenplay, or whatever. Uh, in front of you. Thank you. With, uh, with all the Star Trek novels you've written, did you have to get approval from Gene or Rick first, or did you pitch in the story, or? All, all of the novels are approved by Star Trek Central. Okay. And now that's no longer true, they're now approved by CBS for some reason. Um, I guess because there is no longer a Star Trek Central. Um, but yes, everything that, that I've ever written was approved uh, by, by, you know, by, this, uh, by Star Trek. And it used to be that they were approved by one guy who shot in was Richard Arnold, who, um, <laughs> who worked for Gene Roddenberry, who took a singular dislike to me and made approval of the books very problematic. I will give you one instance. I could give you a dozen. This could be a um, I wrote a book called Vendetta. And there's a little disclaimer on the inside of Vendetta. It says something to the effect of, this book is a purely an invention of the writer and is inconsistent in some ways with the world of Star Trek as created by Gene Roddenberry. The reason that disclaimer is in there is because we have something in the book that Richard Arnold swore did not exist, a female boy. <laughs> we were told there is no such thing well, as a female boy. <laughs> this, of course, was before Seven of Nine. Yeah. This was before the Borg freaking queen. <laughs> <laughs> Richard stated there is no such thing as a female boy. Yeah. He never said that when they were when when they were reading the. Uh, the outline. The outline was approved. They then wrote the book based on the outline, and suddenly they said, you can't have a female board. And we said, screw you, you don't get to double dip on approvals. And they insisted on that disclaimer being in there because Richard insisted there was no such thing as a female board. So does, did every, does everything get approved? Yes. Were there pushbacks? Constant. Working with the licensed properties, did you have anything that uh, that you tried to get by that, that was shot down? Oh yeah, yeah, I, I I got something got shot down all the time. The best, the best was Q. The best was Q. I wrote Q. And Pocketbook sent it off to Paramount. And usually they would approve it in a couple of months. Months went by and we heard nothing. And you know we kept sending. This is before emails, so they kept sending letters and faxes and I put it out. And I was at a creation conference in February, and Richard was there. And so I was on stage, and I proceeded to read a scene from Q&A to great approval by the audience. I read the sequence where Loxana is beating the shit out of him. <laughs> and Riker says, what should we do? And Warp says, sell tickets. <laughs> <laughs> Richard goes back to Paramount and sends a furious letter to Octobook saying, authors are never to read from their books at conventions ever again, especially when they haven't been approved. And Cuban law at this point is not approved. It has to be heavily rewritten. It is an insult to Star Trek. The editor said, what's wrong with the book? Again, dead silence. Now it's April. Major Barrett is going to be coming to a local convention. I said to the editor, give me a copy of the manuscript and the book cover. We already had the book cover. I said, I'm going to go give it to Major. And say, not mention Richard or anything but say that I'd like her to read it over to get her feedback on the character who walks on. And the editor says, you realize if she hates it, we're dead. And I said, we're going to miss shipping as it is now if we don't get something going. So I brought her the manuscript. She's sitting at her table and I bring it to her. And she looks at it. She says, I'm on the cover. <laughs> I said, well, sure. She says, 
I haven't been on a cover since April of 1991. Uh, like, holy crap. And I said, well, I would be really interested if you could read it and give me a feedback on it. And she says, I will read it on the plane home, which she did. The next day, she goes into the Star Trek office and tells anyone with a pair of ears <laughs> about this wonderful new novel called Q and Law that Paramount's going to be coming, and what a terrific novel it is. And have you read this novel, Q and It's so wonderful. And she walks into Richard's office. We have spots, so we buy out. <laughs> she walks into Richard's office and says, Richard, have you read Q and Law? And Richard says, why no? <laughs> but I'll get right on that. Mabel then calls me and raves to me everything she loves about the novel. I am taking meticulous note of everything she loves. Richard then sends us a four-page letter about everything that he wants changed in the novel. And he hit every single thing that Major loved. Including, he wanted us to take out the sell tickets line, mm -hmm. right? Oh. Major was going, sell tickets, I love that! <laughs> <laughs> so our response to three quarters of the letter was, ooh, no, uh, Major loved that one. We're going to be keeping that in. <laughs> <laughs> and that's how Kilo Law got published, all thanks to Major Barrett.